Good evening and welcome again to yet another stream from Animation Pandemic and tonight with us we have the usual suspects. We have Max Bottega, co-founder of Mac and Cheese Games and he's doing his own indie game. Then we have Francesca Pesce, lead compositor, lighter and compositor at Blue Zoo Animation. And then we have Daniele Duri, whom I always Hello. get wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you, you will get this correct. Let's, let, let me try that. So, uh, yeah. principal yeah. gameplay animator at CG Project Red, right? Yeah. Assistant to the regional manager. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and, and today the topic of to, tonight's uh, call is age versus obsolescence, I guess. Do you pronounce it that way? I think it would be interesting. Probably I butchered the pronunciation badly. We need but, a British person here. But that's because I'm obsolete myself. So there you go. <laughs> we can probably call it a night. By the way, I would like you to, I would like you to notice that Daniele was so happy about this call that he's wearing something white. I mean, it never happens. It, uh, in it the, is a very, very, very. That very that bad. that what? Well, yeah, there was something yeah. that was like yes. uh, uh, off place. <laughs> there was right? something wrong he somewhere, and now I understand. <laughs> no. You why, understand why, why what's going wrong, on in there? <laughs> it's, it's like uh, like Gandalf, right? Ah, uh, like yes, Gandalf. you were born. <laughs> You became or, or is white. it like when I, when I wear shirts because my, all my t-shirts are, are, are no, no, sweating? No, no. Actually, no. They, they are actually, uh, it's not because I'm out of shirts. No. <laughs> it's a choice, guys. It's a choice. So I think we could start with some definitions as we usually do. Remember, that's always a good place to start because it's never a guarantee that we know what we're talking about. In fact, we very rarely do, I think. So. <laughs> but we're good at pretending that we are. <laughs> we are really good at it. But it's a... It's a it's a human sport, I guess. So in here, I'm looking at the definition of age. Age is the length of time during which a being or thing has existed. Length of life or existence to the time spoken or of or referred to. So a period of human life or in general life. It's just a period during which something has existed. I think I'm, I'm happy with this definition and now I want to compare it with obsolescence. Or is obsolescence? I don't really know. Uh, so obsolescence. obsolescence. <laughs> obsolescence. <laughs> I don't know. This is so bad. Not even gonna try. <laughs> obsolete. So obsolete means no longer used or needed. Usually because something newer and better has replaced it. So that hurts. That hurts, <laughs> especially for people who have been around for a long time. I think it does hurt. I would like to check another definition, though, right now, because I think the debate between age and, obsol and, and being obsolete, I will take the shortcut there, has something to do with experience as well. So I would like to check the definition for experience. Just a second, let, let us get there. So for experience, we have the process of getting knowledge of or skill from doing, seeing or feeling things. 
not bad. So this is one of the definitions from the dictionary of uh, Cambridge. And then we have the Merriam-Webster. So definition of experience, direct observation of or participation in events as a basis of knowledge. The fact or state of having been affected by or gained, or gained knowledge through direct observation or participation. So I think these three things go, go together. What do you think, guys? Age being obsolete and experience. I don't know you. I, you just confused me so much. You, you talked <laughs> a lot and you read a lot of stuff. And this reminds me that time in high school where somebody t finally told us, "Don't start your essay with the definition of the word because oh, yeah, everybody yeah. does that." So I will jump in. I will jump in to yeah. I will jump in to say that uh, um, when I when I, I proposed the title for this um, for this this call. What came into my mind, like the reason why I am uh, uh, I'm not obsessed, but like I, I keep this thing in my mind in general, is it, it was triggered by watching this Terminator movie. I think it was the last one. Yes. Where, so can yeah. I? Yeah. Well, you got the clip. Last, last, last I one, have I mean, the clip. Yes. The second. Yes. So we could I, say that. Yes. So <laughs> Max was that. suggesting when when we when he proposed this subject, he asked me, "Can you?" Please play that. And I forgot, Max. Sorry. So here you go. Oh, this it's is fine. What, it's fine. This is what I'm old, not obsolete. Let's go. Yeah. Again. So I'm for the old. first time, like I, I actually not uh, uh, um, put it on myself. Like uh -huh. I, I'm not really old, but like in general terms, in the in the in the work in the industry, and that's what we're talking about. I, I, I technically I'm starting to get old, but. That I finally, I, 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 it was very clear to me the difference between old and obsolescence. So the, the, the fact that it, it's what puts you out of the game is not the fact that you're aging, it's the fact that you stop experiencing. So the, the fact that you stay behind. So old is something that uh, uh, is, is a generic term for like saying how, how, many, how much time you have been around and how close you are to the grave, basically. <laughs> but uh, in, in average terms, of course. But obsolete means that you're kind of useless. So, uh, and since with these these talks that we have are mostly about uh, working, uh, not necessarily for money. For example, I'm not working for money at the moment, unfortunately. So, obsolete means that you're kind of like useless in the in the in the stuff that you that you are involved in. And uh, um, probably the 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 difference is is the experience. So, when you stop stop experiencing stuff, you're you start to be frozen in time. You're frozen, frozen in time. In that time, where you stop experiencing, and that's why you become useless. Because uh, uh, other people that are doing concurring on the same uh, uh, task that you do in the job, like your your colleagues, that keep experiencing, they will get ahead. They will get more useful. They they will get more uh, uh, skilled, and this is extremely important in a job like ours that is based on technology. That's probably why we are obsessed by, well, rightfully obsessed with staying up to date and the concept of obsolescence. Obsolescence? Obsolescence? Whatever. Gonna make, we're not going to make it. But, <laughs> but why do you say that since you grow old, you stop experiencing stuff? Well, in general, you stop experiencing stuff. Like it, It's physiological that you don't have that desire to work up to 2, 2 a.m. to check a new software. Uh, you stop making new friends. Uh, you stop even like going out at night, and and like there are some physiological changes and psychological changes that uh, are probably driven by also the fact that you you experience a lot, so you're not curious anymore, and things start to be repetitive. So to find something that is entertaining, for example, it's harder. Like why do I stop reading manga because I read so many of them? that the search of something that is some interest to me is very hard. Why do I stop watching like all those series? Because it, they start to feel repetitive. Why do I stop doing something that I used to like? Because it doesn't provide me new information. So uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's, I would say that's pretty but much you, it. You, I think, you could yeah. still go somewhere else, 
Francesca, what do you say? The, well, there, there is also like something I experienced when uh, when I start learning languages, new languages. You think like uh, you, you you feel like there is a really uh, difference in how people also learn uh, when they're younger and when they're older. And now for languages, it's really obvious. So if you're younger, you pick it, pick languages up much quicker. And, and but I noticed like a huge difference if you are uh, 50 or 60 compared to a person in their 20s, even if the person in the 20s hardly studies, still gonna pick up the language much quicker, which also makes it like, uh, obviously it's a, uh, it's a push for them to, to learn because it's, it's faster and quicker for them. Yeah. Uh, while when you are in, yeah, in, in, your, in your 50s, uh, you may be like, you know, you're not so quick. So you also know, you don't have that, that push. And maybe well, you're not interested anymore. Because as Mark said, you, you went through so many things that you think like you already seen it all, even if it's not true. Well, your brain changes when you're yeah. that old. Like your, your synapses tend to die. There's actually only one proven, um, uh, a proven, scientifically proven way to prevent that from happening as is physical exercise, like weightlifting, cardio. Oh, no. Because that, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, because that <laughs> makes the blood flow to your brain and helps the, the thing stay alive. And when you're old, also, you don't speak with people that much. You're not mm -hmm. like looking for, so I think that also doesn't help with languages. But have, you, in have, general, you noticed, like, have you noticed yeah. that even during the lockdown, our capabilities of speaking as decreased <laughs> no, it, it is I... completely true sorry i, I had like a, like a drinking thing with the colleagues the last week and i realized i i was like like kind of stuttering or i didn't mm. know how to 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 make a long sentence and <laughs> and it's weird because in the end i i still do talk to to the camera of the pc right now but but uh, it was a difference in actually meeting the, the, the people in, in you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, there is the component of the body language, which as an animator, you have to study. Remember, I think body language, body language accounted for about 80% of the, of the communication in a physical situation or something We've like that. <laughs> so I, I think you don't have that anymore. So when you're in front of real people, all of a sudden you, <laughs> you have to relearn, yeah. <laughs> which, I, which I think is, um, is, is relevant to our conversation because it's, you still have to train. I think growing old doesn't mean that you stop experiencing stuff. It just means that you may have to do a more active effort to, to, to train your memory, to to train your your way of interacting with people. I am growing less and less patient by the day, I think. <laughs> I, I confirm that. But it, I think it's, uh, you still can find something interesting. So I think, I mean, I'm not that old, but my personal way of uh, uh, keeping myself challenged is doing different things from my normal routine. So in 3D, uh, saying I join a webinar or I go to a festival or I do, uh, I don't know, like I, I make like, maybe a lecture or I try to do a pitch in my in my studio for uh, to propose a short. I mean, there are different, different things from the usual uh, routine because that means like uh, it's something different from me. My brain kind of switch off from the normal routine of work and I have the chance to learn something, some, something new. So, so I guess we established that there is a routine issue. <laughs> if uh, the there more, is and, and somebody in the, in the chat saying, is saying, for instance, stop learning and you will get old fast. So the yeah. moment you, you establish a routine that won't change forever, then now you're stuck in the loop and you stop learning. Why would you need to learn anything? I think there's also a component in learning, which is necessity. And if you are in a routine which is settled and works, then you don't have yeah. the necessity to learn anything. So you, you tend to go into your loop and who knows. <laughs> what and, the, the, and, and to stay in, 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 like in, a, in a situation like our, our job, that imagine that it's a train that keeps moving, right? The, if you jump off the train and you stop learning stuff, to catch again the train, it gets harder and harder the more you wait. So if you stay like one year or two years without practicing this job, good luck ju jumping back on it again. You can certainly do it probably after 10 years as well, but the effort, the, the massive amount, like the, the, the beginning curve to get back on the train, yeah. it requires an effort that maybe at some age you're not willing to, to, to yeah. do. Yeah, uh, speaking of which, I've every now and then I, I, I do something with 
Blender very, very seldomly. And now I'm doing something with Unreal. And I have to admit that the routine of being very familiar with Maya and <laughs> operating mm -hmm. Maya with my eyes closed, I know every crack, yes, I know every yes. bug. In, uh, in Blender or Unreal, whenever something goes wrong, my usual checklists don't apply in that realm. So I can, I can know what's going off wrong with an animation, but I don't know why the software is behaving in a certain way. So, and, and I can see that that comes from the fact that I just routinely uh, felt at home with Maya. And so now off, I feel like it's a lot of work to, to switch to anything else. So, but it's still something. If, if you find a place where you can experiment that, you can still, I think, catch up as Max was saying, but the curve is steep, yes. I think when it comes to up software, because I find it personally challenging as well, like if you need to start a software from, from scratch, it's more challenging than learning maybe a small extras here and there. So if I need to, for, ex for example, one thing for me is learning, yeah, Blender, I still haven't touched it properly. I mean, I open it twice and I and my plan is to learn it, but I haven't done it because I don't have a project as our, a goal uh, or something I would be using Blender for. Uh, but for instance, I've been, I don't know, uh, playing with Bifrost because I needed a, sim a quick simulation and Bifrost is still in Maya. So it's only a limited amount of information that I need to get uh, started with, with Bifrost. Or maybe, I don't know, I need a uh, cloth simulation. I go Marvelous Design, which is quite of a simple software. So it's not like learning an entire new 3D software, which is Blender. Uh, and for that, you, you do need like maybe a goal. I think if you just think like uh, you just sit on your in your off, in your spare afternoon and you say, "Oh, what do I do? what should I do? Let's learn Blender." I don't think I will be doing it. But say, uh, for instance, when I did the speech at Bluezoo, uh, there was this plan of um, of using new softwares, new, uh, and I thought like, well, with this chance. If I win the pitch, then I will get to use the new software. So that that would have would have made would have, would have made it a, a proper goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, without without a goal, it's a lot harder to learn. I mean, of course, you can rely on the chance that you get some, something interesting, something that interests you naturally. But as we said earlier on, if as you grow old, you are less open to those chances. I guess. Having said that, I don't think that the fact that you you are old and maybe you don't use a particular software uh, is something that is necessarily a big issue all the time. I mean, I've, recently I've been working with people who came from a different background and um, specifically someone who came from a background from Blender. And I realized that I had a series of checklists on on managing my own assets and my own procedures that I had there because of the age because of the time I spent working in a certain environment. So for instance, I knew that when you export an FBX, you can expect surprises and you should there check is, all the settings to know what goes on. There seems to be a bit of uh, inter interfering, interference, interference <laughs> with the audio. Yeah. Interference. Oh, do you hear? I, 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 don't, I don't hear it. It's gone I, now. Still... Yes, I heard it. It's gone. Okay, okay. It's gone? <laughs> is it gone? Yeah, it's gone. Okay. What does it mean? <laughs> Uh, oh, it was just like you... a bit of a background noise. Okay. It's because you moved and you shouldn't move, you know that. But I, 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 told you you that. I muted yeah. the mic. <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 I think like from my side, I hear like a general background noise now. But if you don't hear it, it's fine. Who's, <laughs> that, it's not... who's that person standing behind you, Francesco? <laughs> <laughs> so I was saying... Nice. <laughs> So I was saying when, for instance, if you have worked in video games, you know that you will have to export your animation as an FBX at a certain point. And if you had, if you had to export your animation as, a FB, as an FBX at a certain point, you will know that you have to check the scale, you have to check the baking, you have to check the axis, you have to check a number of things, you have to check the simplification of the curves, you have to check a number of things. You have and to check which setting for the importer is in the game yeah, engine. With I mean, exporter is the, in the 3D software. And the, and the, until a few years ago, even the version of the FBX importer and exporter was a major uh, in, incognito um, factor there. And I realized that you may be working in a software for a long time and still, since you didn't have that experience, you don't really know what you're doing the moment you leave that software. And I think that's when experience and age come in, when you have been... When you have been 
having so many issues <laughs> along the <laughs> way that by now you don't really think that that thing is going to work automatically. So I think part of age is understanding that things don't work, although they do work out in the end very often. <laughs> I think you, you yeah. might have developed a way, like if you did well your your work up until now, you, 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 yeah, you develop like a way to find a shortcut of how find a way to uh, to make things work while uh, if you've just gone out of school, uh, yeah. you have more this idea that if you do that, that and that, things should be working. You don't know what happens if like uh, from step A, from step C, something uh, breaks. Yeah, in fact, whenever I, I'm working in a group project and somebody proposes a new workflow, and this is something to do with age, I think, and experience, when they, when, whenever a new workflow is proposed and say, oh, we could do that, and maybe the deadline is tomorrow, and <laughs> I'm, thinking, I'm thinking, okay, I start asking asking questions and I say, well, okay, you're out. <laughs> no, I know. I mean, because I, I, I don't, I don't say anything like that because what if they have experience? What if they actually know what they're talking about or they speak of experience themselves? You don't know. So usually I ask questions. So do you think you can deliver by tomorrow? Do you, did you account for these issues? Do you think this will be an issue? Do you think this, this can work this way or that way? And then based on the answers, I kind of realize whether they have experience in that sector or they are just having an idea, but they didn't really uh, estimated the time it takes to, to um, how do you say, to put that in practice. And speaking of which, I would say probably age <laughs> doesn't really really match it. That doesn't really match experience. Mm. So you can you can just grow grow old, or you could grow old and experienced. You you can do both things. This, so, this is kind of the worst thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think people who maybe grow old in a, an environment that is really protective and they don't mm -hmm, experience mm -hmm. uh, troubles, yeah. um, they tend to be in a difficult situation because the moment the environment changes, it's it's really a shock. I they think. You know how to to and then this kind of taps into a topic I think we had in the past of changing companies. Oh More yes, we enough. discussed because, this because it, you know it's kind of the effect is very similar because you're gonna stay in with a company like five years, ten years, and then you're so used to that company that you will have a hard time surviving outside. And it, you know it goes a bit in the same direction if we think about it. Yeah, which reminds mm -hmm. me of an event that happened mm -hmm. recently in one of the projects I was mm -hmm. working on. Um, somebody was having troubles uh, just. Uh, opening some Maya files that I set up. The Maya files contained a number of nested references. So it was important that you set the project before opening the file. Otherwise, Maya wouldn't link anything correctly. But the thing is, this person was very used to a pipeline where you could just press a button and Maya would self-set. But in the project we were working in, <laughs> It was pure. Maya, yes. Yeah, it was pure anarchy that you had to take care of this stuff on your side. So I, I, again, if you if you are for a long time under the umbrella of a pipeline, you may not even know anymore um, that these problems exist. At the same time, one would wish that this pro this problem didn't exist in the first place. If you see what I mean, I mean <laughs> because. But I, you you're gonna have problems even like when you you get a new version of Maya. I think you're still gonna have problems and bugs. So I think the the idea that you have a background knowing what could go wrong. And what could be the cause of it is still helpful. I st and, and I know like uh, how you, f you feel about this, Daniele. So like I've, obviously I'm on the other side because I've been in the company for eight years. And uh, from my from my side, I think like if yeah you don't if you do project or you build a project where you don't need you don't have a pipeline yet, uh, it's still a good practice, a good exercise because you yeah you you don't necessarily I mean before the pipeline is built for a project. Uh, if you're making the templates and all, you you mm -hmm. have to to do everything from scratch. So that still makes you a little bit <laughs> no, of course. I mean, it's, not, it's not that it, it's it's bad in one way and right in the other way. But of mm -hmm. course, you, you need to keep your your on your toes, right? Um, yeah. As I, I I can I can tell for sure that when I was in Christ, I can was seven years. I had the periods of just autopilot, and then I was you know doing what I. I was meant to do, but I, you know, the, I was living it as a normal job and uh, without, you know, doing extra things or, or keeping updated or all these things for a while. And then 
honestly, if I think about myself, I I never had like the I don't know if anybody, but the you know never been constant in in this, but it's always a period of slacking and a period of more involvement, right? Not not slacking yes, at work, <laughs> slacking <laughs> on the on the updates, right? But who is because listening course, to us? <laughs> we, we are humans, right? So you also want some spare time to do something, unless you are Amadeo. Yes, true. Yes, yeah. That's... <laughs> because I, I think... Amadeo's way of entertaining is just solving complicated shit, whatever it is. So. Yeah, and and keep working. <laughs> it's very, it's very stressful. I really dislike myself for that because mm, I always, I'm sure. sorry, <laughs> because I, I always end, I always end up from uh, from a pro a project that is full of problems to another one which has more issues. Or, yes. And and uh, it's. I, I have to say, but I have to say that once, uh, actually, I found myself about three times in situations where the pipeline was quite well set. And after a few months, I was just, uh, I didn't, I didn't have anything to do in there. Yeah, I could, I could animate my shots, but where were the problems? And then, and then but, you quit the company. Yeah. And then I quit the company, <laughs> yes. It's too simple. But, <laughs> it, it was a bit a bit too simple, but <laughs> at the same time, there's always the the, tra the trade off. If you are always if you always want to put yourself in a problem, a is stressful, and b you can never become particularly good at anything in spe specifically. I think. I mean, you, you're not going to become the Michelangelo of sculpting, if you see what I mean. If you're always dealing with ancillary issues, whereas, however, if you're always uh, into problems. I think maybe your speciality becomes solving those issues. It might be a personality thing. So it depends. Some people are really good in being really um, professional on one specific task. And for them, it's, it's better to have like a really strong pipeline. And then people, I mean, personally, I prefer to do a, a little a problem solving, um, put different things together. And, and I think in that case, if I had a lot of time, I don't know if I would, be, if I would use it well. Because I prefer mm. to have like, I shouldn't say that. I prefer to have a really tight uh, times and then just like do lots of things and uh, do a sort of puzzle trying to, to fit them all uh, for the uh, delivery. Before we continue, we would like to advise our employers that this conversation has nothing to do with our employment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think they know it in my case. Right. Like I think I became a, a profession professional in trying to fit um, anything in the schedule I'm given. <laughs> so that, that they know, they know it. <laughs> they know it. Yeah, but I, yeah. I think yes. Like if you if you saying uh, to, tomorrow I go to Pixar for who knows which reason, and uh, and then I found myself like having maybe I don't know a week uh, to do like a. 20 frame. I don't know if I would put it to good use. I think probably I would just look around and, and thinking like, what should I do next to refine the shot? But maybe it's the a, quality required is so high that you will be pressed for time, even in a situation like that. I, I, no, I'm sure. It's just like that your the set that your mindset is different when you have um, it, it's, it's different mindsets. Like if you if you if you're used to refine, refine, and refine and polish, it's a different mindset than if you used to. Um, Put something together yeah. as soon as possible and try trying to, to yeah reach a decent quality with the times you're given it's a different approach that's why i think like different people different personality might uh, uh be more suitable for a case to, uh, than another i think there is a an almost natural progression to this uh, uh, this mindset which is you you i think you have necessarily to grow out of the uh grant work of the software and go and manage people and situation in at that yeah. at that stage because you're I mean it's it's the nature of things. You will always find someone who's much younger and has been playing with the, with a particular piece of software for longer and when they were younger. So you can't you can't really they're more productive in a way if the they knew what the, <laughs> yeah, if, if they knew what they were doing uh, in a bigger scheme they would be a lot more productive than than you. And and so I think at that stage your experience is better better suited to a position where you can direct these people to w where the bigger scheme is going rather than uh, sitting down there next to them and doing their job which they can do better than you do probably. Yeah, I think stage. I think like when you just go out of of, of uni and you're not really um, you you not you, you don't understand yet the the, the, the deliveries deadlines the importance of them. And how to also how to speak to people. I find it like it, if you just, I mean, it depends what's your 
education, your background, I guess. But even talking to the client, it's not something you do maybe when you are in your 20s. And maybe it's mm, better yeah. that you don't. Uh, I'm <laughs> glad that I didn't. Um, but it's, yeah, the way you speak, the things you should and you shouldn't say, it's, it's things like that it comes naturally at certain points because you grew up in the environment and you understand uh, better. But be when you are in your 20s, you st I think you still be awkward in that situation. So yeah, you, don't, you probably also don't want to talk to the client, for instance. You could say things in a in a bit in a bit of a blunt way or not saying yeah. things at all. So yeah, and it, it, I think negotiation negotiation is something that you have to learn. But at the same time, I think someone young can still learn it if they are put in the situation. Why not? No, it, they can. It's, it's just that it takes time. Fortunately, yeah, because I otherwise they would be. I disagree in them. here. I disagree in here. I yeah. think negotiation is something that can be learned even as as a kid and it much of it comes from the family as well if and in fact it's i think it's a bad situation if you grow adult and you haven't experienced negotiation ever and now you Ooh. find yourself as an adult uh, I, I haven't i mean i don't know which kind of family you come from but like i no, i don't i never never well, experienced negotiation. I'm has three brothers you know, oh, sorry, okay. two brothers yeah. and a sister. Yeah, yeah, sorry. And two no, sisters. You probably had <laughs> to negotiate, like, pieces of bread to not start <laughs> okay. with that. True, true story. So, like, toys it's and, like... Too dramatic, right? but, yeah. You have well, to fight for the fridge. <laughs> I have to say that the negotiations in my family were rather... Uh, binary. It was uh, a black and white negotiation at all times. So I don't think I had much experience. There was never, almost never, I would say, a proper conversation about uh, winning an argument or negotiating a compromise it was always either yes or no most of the time would you, no. would you say that there was not even an implicit negotiation or like hmm. some, some kind of because negotiation doesn't necessarily have to go to words like sit at the table and okay, say i yes. give you this and i give it that so yeah there was an implicit i would say covert negotiation going on at all times so, but it was always something that would go as black ops under the radar. You, you, in, practi in practice, you would want to leave the, the smallest footprint ever. <laughs> so Let's put it this way. Like, I assume that a single child has zero negotiation to make during his childhood. Literally zero. What do you need to negotiate with? Like, there's nobody that you need to, to bargain with, apart from your parents. Maybe they and you, you have, like, three brothers. So uh, I'm sure that there's, like, you... You, you were definitely uh, in contact with some form of negotiation through uh, as you I grew think up. I might have been exposed to it, but not not knowingly. I have to think it through, Max. I don't have an answer for the, for this. But <laughs> that's why I see I see suggest that 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 uh, video that I, I suggested many uh, um, episodes ago about Chris Boss and the art of negotiation. Uh, that's why yes. it's very good. Yes, I remember. I think one thing about experience, though, is that you have been around for so long. You have seen so many projects going the wrong way, bad. That's awesome. going back, <laughs> yeah, careening towards their delivery, <laughs> crashing to the delivery. To, I would say crashing to a successful delivery. And at a certain point, I think you can see um, in, an, in, in advance what's going to happen in many instances, in fact. And this probably forces you to learn some negotiation if you don't want to go through the same accident as well. I think that something interesting. I was reading statistics about gliding accidents in the UK because uh, there was this, this stereotype for which uh, people with more experience, they tend to crash more because they take more risks. You mean airplane gliding? Gliding, gliding yes, air, air, airplane, uh, sailplane, yes. yes. And so I was thinking, okay, because I read it many years ago, and then I went to check a, a, um, a, a research just before this call, and apparently the, it seems that glider pilots with leader experience in, uh, in command of a plane has twice the have twice the number of accidents per launch. And f <laughs> so, so in practice, people with less experience, or I would say with a bit more than nothing, they tend to have a lot more um, more accidents. The people who, but they have they have less accidents than people who just started, because the people who just started in that situation they are aware of the dangers and they're very worried about them. They're very concerned, so they tend to have a higher level of caution. 
But as soon as you pass that that area in which you you know what you think you know what you're doing, then you become compl complacent. And there's I think there's a plateau there in which a lot of accidents are happening. And then there's another curve going up. So I think with experience and age, it comes the problem for which you think you know things, but you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's when the line of new software and old experience tend to meet. So, mm -hmm. because new software may solve some of the problems that you thought were problems and they are no longer issues. So I think that there is something there for which age, experience and being obsolete meet together. I can give you a very recent example of that. As I, as I, as I know, I'm developing, I'm prototyping with, with my, my colleagues at, uh, at uh, uh, Mac and Cheese Games. We are prototyping some games. And, and today we were we started prototyping a new one. I opened uh, Nico, the, the, my, my programmer uh, friend. Uh, uh, he started a new project, and I asked him, Nico, like I noticed that we were using like Unity like 2018. I I still ask like, is there any reason we are using that instead of like the latest ones? I no, this is the one that is installed on my computer. And I was like, yeah, fine, <laughs> yeah, fine, yeah. but like. 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, I would have just like, oh, no, let's use the latest one just because. And now I'm like, I've been, I, I, I was burned by that fire so many times <laughs> that that you just like, no, like, yeah, let's fucking true. stay with the, the, like, is there, is there really a reason to move? Like, are we really need of those features for the latest version? I don't really think so. So you, you start doing things if you really need it and you're very cautious on, on just jumping on the on the new software on the new bandwagon just because because like you see the like empires uh, uh, raise and fall during your twenty years of, of, of right? <laughs> because of the so, latest version of the software. I know if if anything this I mean the, the experience made me like complete conservative bitch honestly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I I don't know I'm like I'm start to be terrified of, not, not of new things but of changing things in the way we were saying like it, sometimes it's just too risky it just it, you just want to have the work done and this is you know always a major undertaking of yeah unless you leave it as a, a mega investment so for instance uh, in the current situation there are companies who are using blender to animate stuff and and that's a long term investment in my in my opinion and 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 I I opened up Blender and and I used it a little bit and the animation tools are actually quite cool in my opinion there there, there are a lot of tools that are not there in Maya and they should be there in Maya. However, however, uh, Max and Daniela know that I'm finishing uh, an Unreal course that I took just to know how things were over over that side, and we had a Blender user in the group. And and um, in the movie we had two characters, which used the same rig, so they were nearly identical. So I built in Maya a rig variation, one rig, two variations, <laughs> and uh, this person wanted to use Blender, of course. And we said, yeah, okay, cool. And so I tried Blender and I imported the first rig, and I was like, works, ready to animate. I referenced the second rig, doesn't work. And I spent the next two hours figuring out why the second rig wouldn't work until I discovered that Blender does not support historically two rigs the same. You can't reference two rigs which are the same by default. You have to find a workaround to do that. Oh. So I was thinking, okay, then that means that companies are making a long-term investment. They are use switching to Blender because they have an estimate in X years Blender will be fully functional. Well, let me tell free. you one thing. What happened there was the gazillions of dollars that Epic funneled into into Blender. Be, be, Epic uh, financed Blender massively two years ago for the development, officially. Yeah, so yeah. all the companies jumped in. Where I, I would say I would say wisely uh, um, incentivated by by this. Then Blender is going to be uh, a reliable tool. I think like so those, too. Yeah, yeah. I think so. The problem is that 
then I see YouTube videos from animators who said, oh, we did the previous production and we didn't really have a post manager yet. It was there only at the end of the production. And, and Max and, and Francesca, post manager is essential to run a big production. You can't really, I mean, you can, of course, work without that. But in practice, you are telling the animators to work like we used to work 20 years ago. Yeah, so, but keep in mind that large production also have tools, like people that write tools that they are not released yeah. to the public. In and, fact, and Blender is, is crucial for that. And, and in fact, they went, I also learned that in this in the, in the big productions, they actually went past the limit of the two rigs. So they, they can operate Blender pretty much like they operate Maya. And probably, I would dare to say, maybe even better. But I don't have direct experience of that. But so it seems to me, <laughs> I think that's the point where experience and uh, new software meet and you have to decide which way to go. I think Blender is going to become a, a reliable tool. And, and that's and the reason why I'm going to ditch. I, I use, I, I've been modeling in Modo for the last <laughs> 15 years. <laughs> Modo is, is just, I think, the best thing ever when it comes to modeling. No, so, no other like software. A, always the same or they kept up updating and well they kept updating it it's 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 amazing uh, uh -huh. when it, when it just comes to modeling i i never found anything as good as that even blender is not as good as mod as far as i'm concerned but mm -hmm. i'm still gonna jump on blender when we start actually producing stuff for the uh, for the game even if i barely touched it a couple of years ago because i think it's something that it's worth being involved in to avoid becoming yeah. obsolete in that aspect I right. think so too. By the way, Max, in the chat, there's someone who says that uh, they have been putting off learning Maya for years and they, they have been using Modo for a long time and they found it hard to get production work. Now you're telling them you're jumping on Blender. I'm not sure how they feel about that. Well, you know that <laughs> I, I, I tried Maya, so it, it really depends what your production work is. Uh, I'm never going to animate a horde of characters. I'm not an animator. And animation is something that you can import and export, especially for games with FBX, no problem. So if I have an animator, I hire somebody that wants to use Maya, fantastic. But for all that is related to what I am going to do, so like modeling and uh, uh, proxy making and, 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 and yeah, environment, maybe some, some uh, unwrapping, like the, the, the traditional modeling pipeline. Uh, I'm certainly going to use Blender because I've seen it use it in action. I've seen people animate and rigging it. I rigged it in, in, in Blender. And for what I need to do, that is not a triple A production, it's just fine. And mm -hmm. it's also up to me to not push myself into the corner that I ask too much from that software. And I'd rather have less functions than to go through the pain of using Maya. It's so uh, old clunky, abhorrent visually, that I, I am too old to do that kind of, that, that's, a, that's a limit I set to myself. When I, when I, I see how Maya manage a v, UV unwrapping, for example, I'm like, no, I, I, I rather change it. I'm, 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 I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. I, I'm not gonna do that's that. It. So. <laughs> to be fair, now I don't know if anybody from Autodesk is also listening to, to, to me, but it's also the, the price of the of the software. It's like if you yeah. build a new studio, it's massive and it's really and there is like a, there are yeah. rules as well of like how you can use it as a company certain version of Maya and not certain others and you have to keep updating it. It's costly. So if Blender is like a viable solution, it, it is you invest in that. Honestly. Yeah, yeah, it's super costly. That, and that, that also, is the biggest, the biggest problem I, I personally have. Like, and this, this is why lots of companies actually are trying to move. Is that the one, the, one of the reasons why it's not that quick is because all of us are on Maya and all the artists are still uh, yeah, working in Maya. Nice. But if you invest as a company, if you invest in like the, the leads and supervisor learning Blender, for instance, then you have that you have them training everybody else joining the company. And after a while, you, you might actually break that moment where you don't find artists. Yeah. So I think it's a viable solution rather than paying an hour. I don't remember how much my one single license of Maya costs, but I think it's 3000 maybe, I don't know, something like that. Yeah, even the you, fact... pay, you pay a monthly fee, right? So, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, yes, I think it was three. Yeah, yeah now, which the monthly fee is also, I mean, it can be, 
good and it can be really oh, it's, it's fucking outrageous <laughs> yeah i mean if you if you just have to work for like a couple of months or something maybe it makes sense but i, I don't know I, I just i really liked the idea that before i owned a uh, software yes, rather than you now you own don't it. own yeah, any yeah, software it's true, it's true. you just keep paying <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just... Medeo, for that out of the sponsorship. No, no yeah, in fact, no. I, I this is derailing. It's becoming a Blender versus Maya thing. Let's say yeah, yeah, Blender let's, is going. Let's, 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 let's wrap it up. Blender is going to win, guys. That's it. There's no way <laughs> around it. Okay, it's we have just to the way we have to bring is. this up again in then two years and see if we were wrong. But <laughs> I, I think, think we will. I think we are right. Come on. Maya 2021 didn't even come out. Maya 2022 has a couple of minor features and then it breaks all the old scripts because it uses the new Python. So, and which is an update that has to be done anyway, you know? So, so it, there's, sorry, there's Michael Glance that I just asked a question. I'm always hesitant to base too much on free software. What do you think? I mean, I'm based on free software for Google email and Google docs in the last 15 years. It's kind of work. So in general, like you cannot uh, think that stuff is not valid just because it's free, especially in the in the sense of, of uh, Blender, uh, um, Michael, keep in mind that it's not really free. Uh, Epic, like I need to check, but Epic, I don't know how many million dollars uh, put into financing um, Blender. So it's not free. It's not that we are not paying for it. Somebody else is. Somebody is paying for it. Yeah, Fortnite is paying for it. But... Well, I, I can say, like, because I think that from what I heard, because again, I didn't really play enough with, with Blender, but from, within the company, I think one of the, once you pick up a new software, if you are a really big company, you have to rebuild the entire workflow and pipeline. And obviously that costs money, which probably in the long run is far cheaper than Keep Maya anyway, but it, it is a long process. So I think it's, it's something to, they, so they, they need to, as a company, you need to test it first and make sure it works on small projects. And once you build the pipeline and the workflow, you go for it. So I think it's it's not a, it's not an immediate um, straightforward process, but I think like a, it, it makes sense that you that you start it as a company. But it depends yeah. also on your budget and on your time <laughs> and when the client require when the when the client deadline is. I think from my side, I do YouTube tutorials every now and then on Maya, and if you check the numbers of a Maya tutorial even of people who are actually famous and they do stuff that is seen, we are in the order of a few thousands, maybe a hundred thousands. But if you check Blender tutorials, the user base is millions of people. So I think even by the sheer amount of numbers, if you, even if you take 1% of these people and say these people can program and they will code something for Blender, even these people alone are enough critical mass, in my opinion, to go mm -hmm. over Maya several times. <laughs> yeah, also that the company that you talk about, Francesca, mm -hmm. a company that needs to update itself. There are, there's also a, another way, like they don't have to shift all the production. They can just like start hiring people that know Blender. And yeah, that... I find it's a, it's a bit, I mean, it's not, I'm not talking about one or two people, but I think like it's a, if you need to hire 20 or 30 people, it might become more limited. I tell you, I tell you just that by experience. So things can change. It probably will change soon. So it won't be a problem, probably in the next half, half a year or one year. But for now, I think like whenever you hire people, uh, finding someone that uses Blender, uh, it's it's a bit it's it's not that common. And also you have a restricted choice. So saying you're looking for a lighter, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you find more lighters in Maya. Again, this is just temporary. I think this is gonna go. Uh, in a short yeah, I think like I expect the curve to spike, yeah. especially because spike. new young people yeah. are gonna enter the industry, and uh, that's when mm. I think like I really need to learn Blender. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, so, I, I would say that Blender in this case we have been talking extensively about Blender versus Maya mode, etc. But like it's just an example of the fact that this is another way how you avoid becoming obsolete. Yeah. Because like if you even for us, let's say that I get uh, I am I am I don't I'm. I need to, I want to work again as a modeler. Uh, I need to learn, I need to get updated on modeling. Because since I started, I, since last time I was modeling hardcore, like for production, a lot of time, a long time has passed. I need to get up to date with Substance Painter, I need to sub, get up to date with Substance Designer, I need to get up to date with, I don't know, uh, um, real-time visualization tools and stuff like that. So it's, uh, what I find useful very often is to try to sneak in these things inside my own pipelines. 
that's why I'm gonna force myself to to do use Blender because like you know worst case if the company bombs I still learn something if I keep using yeah. models really positive I keep, <laughs> no but I mean you always need like a, a plan B especially if you take high risks right yeah. Yeah. Keep up your up knots, up they up. say, in military aviation. Come again, sorry, my my my. Uh, in sounds... military aviation, they say keep up your knots. That means keep the speed up so that you have energy to come out from a situation if you need to. Yeah. So I think it's you always have to be aware of what goes around you. In the meantime, in the chat, which I remember, people, the chat is open in English, Italian, and Spanish. If you have questions in the chat, there is uh, some. There are some reactions. I think the model artist is saying that Max, based on what we just said, they're probably going to put off learning Maya for a bit longer. And I, <laughs> I <recommend laughs> unless he really wants to work for a, for a company that is using Maya, in that case, uh, just go yeah. for I it. I think. But, what do you think, yeah. Max? I think for modeling, you actually have much more flexibility, right? I mean, it's the X. You can model yeah. even with your. Toaster plus, or your you like coffee <laughs> machine. Plus, what what if you tell the company, "Don't worry, I'm going to use a software you don't have to pay for." Mm. Uh, I yeah, think I think they're gonna be fine. Yeah. You just talk with the IT guys, Blender. Oh, okay, it's fine. Just you don't even need to install it. And it depends there on is... the company, so they might they might have more problems. But I think modeling is well, one of those things. For modeling, it's, uh, modeling it's more is flexible. Yeah. For lighting, it's it not. And 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 then there's a question in the chat that says. Throughout the years, throughout our years in the industry, have have we built a personal rule book of common sense? And common sense is quoted. Many say common sense does not exist because people experience things differently. And what's our experience on this after all of our, our production experiences? I have to say I have a book of common sense. It, the problem is that I haven't written it. So very often <laughs> I forget my own common sense. But there are there are some things, especially at the organizational level, that I think need to be there. If you are working in a production, there's a group of people and that you have to deliver something. You can't, I mean, for instance, one of the things that I find it very difficult to cope with is democratic organization in inside the production. I think it's something you can do between people. And I'm, I, I have been reflecting upon this subject for a, for a bit in the past days because I was finishing this group project with some other professionals in Unreal. And none, none of us knew each other before the project. So it's very difficult to establish a proper hierarchy, especially considering that the level of experience is so different between people. And some people want to cover maybe a role and, and, and maybe their experience is somewhere else, is not on that particular role. So it becomes difficult to just, to just let democracy go. And it's also difficult to set a hierarchy there because you can't, you can't take for granted that the role that a person self-picked is going to work in that situation. So for me, my personal common sense book is mostly about organization and double checking the work you do when you do it, double checking. We went through this when we discussed, uh, what was it? Um, we were talking about politics in the workplace for which you need to know the, the people who provide you with the material you're working with and, and the way they work. And you need to know the people this material is going to. So I think that's a rule. You need to know where this material is coming from, where it's going, because this way you know how to make your choices, how to pick your choices. And you can traverse this hierarchy if you need. So, and, and it's not very, I mean, I have a common sense book based on software and say, for instance, in Maya, there are things I would never do. Or if I want to, to export FBXs to Unreal, there are things I would never do, but, or in Unity. But I think the, in the broader sense, the common sense thing is about organization, knowing, uh, knowing other departments and knowing in general the landscape of your production. That's something that I don't think is going to change with any software. What do you think, guys? Sorry for yeah. the long thing. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good point. And I think it's the, the, what, probably what makes us, like, if anything, even if we don't learn anything about software, I think that still what makes us... Um, good employee i think even when we get older obviously i think you still need i mean saying i'm a supervisor and i and suddenly the entire production is a blender and i have no idea how, how blender uh, works i'm probably still gonna be obsolete but the fact that i can give like a, a feedback or predict what kind of problems are gonna come out <laughs> yes. if you do that uh it's probably a good idea and yes the, the idea of like um the hierarchy i think it comes with i mean it, this is like a different i think different people have different opinions but i know that if you leave too many people uh, with the same amount of, uh, of power in a room and you want 
to come up with an idea is probably going to take much longer than if you uh, point someone and you say you are in charge and just make them uh, come up with a decision. Can I change that? Can I amend that? You're not in charge. You're responsible for that. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, because... it's actually my life as a supervisor. It was yeah. like me being responsible for people. I, I never bullied anybody. Because if, like you're, really... if you go around and you say, okay, we're in a room of people of stranger, of strangers, yeah. and you tell someone, okay, who wants to be the lord of the manor? They'll say, me, uh, me, me. But that doesn't mean yeah. they would be responsible for it. So the, the question is, who wants to be responsible for that? Yeah. And I think answering to Manus's question is experience tells you there are some predictable things that can go wrong and can be prevented from going wrong. Yeah. You, you kind of know that's possible. So, for instance, even if you deal with a new software, you know that there's going to be, at a certain point, a point in which you will have to unwrap UVs. And that, you know that. So, well, you the, use question, Maya, then. so the question <laughs> is, if you have to produce a, a thousand assets, the immediate question becomes, so how long does it take to unwrap this stuff? What's the technique? Do we have an AI approach? Do we have to do it manually? I mean, and you can What's ask the best tool question. to do that? What's the best tool? Yeah. And, you, and the answer is not necessarily Blender, although maybe it is Blender. I don't know. But the thing is, you're still, even without knowing Blender or Maya, you still can ask that question because you know you've been through production. You have experienced all sorts of bottlenecks. So you know at a certain point that that is going to be a question you need to ask. And in fact, you need to ask these questions all the time. At every corner, every turn, you, you need to ask questions. What, what, what is the, if in a American foreign policy, they would say, where's the threat? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's something that comes, I think, with experience. And you're going to have it, if, whichever the software is. And that, that's, I think, something that is very difficult to replace. Even, I mean, you can call in a young person and they can tell you they're speedy with the software, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they can deliver because delivering mm -hmm. is something else. I think, can I add something? This is, uh, sure. um, um, yeah, it's just about like people and how they, they grow old in their, in their job. And I think one, one of the things I've experienced by when, when recruiting is that um, sometimes I, I do have doubts if I should hire someone with more experience or less. Uh, and I'm not talking about, I'm talking about like some slight shift. So like between mid, for instance, and senior or between junior and mid, because sometimes in some occasion, and uh, it's better to hire a junior because it's going to be more flexible and open to the new environment, the new pipeline, to the new workflow. So I think like if, you bec if you've been working for a long time, um, long time and you, you know that you actually have good experience and good skills, you probably should never forget to keep some sort of flexibility. So be open to the new environment and the new workflow. Otherwise, you become someone that just because it's senior doesn't want to listen to other people. And I but think it's also a responsibility, sorry, a responsibility of the company to train, to keep training employees. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, I think good like companies, for, they, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for their own good, by the way. Yes, exactly. I think I, I think actually I certainly support that because I think like sometimes personally I don't have maybe the time to to do training and uh, and that's why I've been I've been checking with Bluetooth as well because I want to do the training I don't want to become obsolete and I and if possible I want to do it while also working full time so that that's definitely a point but even like when you get people from outside you know like the thing about the the CG industry there are a lot of people that keep traveling around from studio to studio so studios don't necessarily feel like they need to train people because there's a lot of uh, um, go go and uh, and come come back. So like it's a lot, people moves a lot. So they yeah somehow a lot of company don't train people, especially in their senior roles. I think for juniors uh, like MPC for in, for instance or Framestore, they've been mm -hmm. looking into that. But uh, and also Blue Zoo has been looking into training people. But it's more like for junior roles. For when you get a bit more experience, you find these people that maybe didn't yeah didn't train maybe for a while. Because the company didn't give any support. Yeah, maybe they don't want to invest on some on people that they will train and then will go to work. Somewhere yeah, I, I think that's partly of the culture. I mean, London is really like that. A lot of people keep moving around, so obviously you, uh, they they don't even feel like they should ask the company to train them. Because I've been eight years in the company, I definitely asked this one. I asked for training because I think like it's I, yeah, it, I, you I need think, to train. I think there is something about seniority that is worth considering. Very, I mean, consider a big structure where you have maybe thousands of people, 
the interest of the structure is to make any process, any workflow easy enough so that people with a certain amount, a basic amount of experience can do it. So the problem with they have is that when you hire a junior, that basic amount of experience isn't there. Even if that basic amount of experience is just using the pipeline of the company, that needs to be trained for, I and mean, you need to be training people for. So that's why a big company may be training juniors and not seniors, for instance, because the seniors, they already know how to use the system. That, and that's the primary requirement, really. It's true. Yeah. No, sorry. Go ahead. And if a senior moved from company to company, the structure is very often similar because the philosophy is the same. So that's also why a senior may not get training because they already feel that requirement for which they have the basic proficiency required. It's true. On the other side, I think like a yeah, wait uh, for a put up senior in a position as a supervisor, for instance, for three, four years, five years. And then maybe suddenly like people will be moving again towards Blender rather than Maya. This senior is completely useless if he doesn't learn mm. Blender yeah. because he can give feedback obviously, obviously on a, I mean, depends again. If you are an art director, that wouldn't make any difference. Maybe if you are an animator, it wouldn't make any difference. But for lighting, whereas that you need to give a lot of technical support uh, and compositing as well. Like I, I think I, I don't think I would be really useful as a supervisor without a knowledge of Blender. For I think any any position in which your job is to let's say uh, to take people out of the technical swamps. <laughs> yeah. Whenever you are in this position, I think you need to be updating constantly because uh, you know, you can say you want it more blue. But if the person underneath is struggling because they have a technical issue, I mean, not only they can't make it blue, they can't even make it red. And probably it happened to be green because it just <laughs> happened to be green. And they didn't know. Like <laughs> <laughs> so there is a different, there is an issue of experience there, of, of professional age there, that you have to solve with a technical intervention. That's why as a senior, you need to be um, experienced. And I so, think so if I can just say, if you don't want to learn Blender, just be animation director, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in a big company, guys, not in a small oh, one. Oh, okay? I have because to say, like, there is, one. I mean, even, like, I have a, there is a director, um, I mean, on a, pro, on a project before, the, I mean, like, one year ago, uh, we ended up the project with, like, uh, all the people leaving as in they, they ended their contract. And it was just me and the director. Uh, left on the project and then I found myself doing the fixes, the animation fixes, the director also doing the animation fixes. Mm -hmm. So I think okay. in that case, still useful that the director remembers okay. how to do okay. it. How to do, uh, how to set a couple of keys. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Could be useful. I mean, that and saved me as well, like uh, knowing how to put the keys in. Uh, that's the, yeah, that's as much as my animation skills goes. <laughs> but, oh, okay, sorry, maybe um, but, uh, this is on the topic anyway. Uh, like a way to combat the, the obsolescence, uh, it's just to go to a managerial position, right? So this is kind of, yeah. I mean, not, not just, but you know, not for everything. Of course, if you are IT, you still need to know what you're doing. But I would say if you want to detach yourself from the updates that constantly come all the time, then go into a more managerial position. It sounds a bit helps on that. It sounds a bit tricky that way. It's like saying if you don't want to learn it, just go and manage people. But well, that's well, exactly what on. we what I don't agree with. <laughs> I know you don't agree, but this is how it works. I mean, I, I think to be a decent manager, you also need to keep updated. Like you need to, you know, need to, yeah. even to keep updating in management software. You need to keep updated in management techniques. You need to keep updated in psychology. Uh, yes, in, in, sure, in business psychology. Management. <laughs> yeah, true. I mean, imagine <laughs> that you, you, you <laughs> suddenly, extent, suddenly you have extent. to you have to deal with millennials. You're not prepared for that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you have to go and watch what they watch. <laughs> what, what, what do you mean, millennials? Millennials are forty years old now. I know, I know. Is it like the <laughs> what's the generation now? Is it oh? Z Zoom. Why? What's it? I don't know. It's like I lost it the track of what's It doesn't what's really name. matter, but Max is having is making. I think he's making a bit of a point at least. There, you you still have to you have to be person savvy no, if you I, want I'm to be saying, a manager. I'm not saying that, that you can chill, okay? But um, I think if you want to to detach yourself from from these kind of updates on Blender on the latest software that inevitably will come out, then 
Yeah, this you're. Is, this, is this is a bit the way to do it. I guess. I, I, I think, think it happens. I think, I think it definitely like it's really common. Uh, I don't I personally. I think it's a personal choice if you want to go all in in that direction or not. I think personally, I'm just worried that if you do it, you might at certain points be easily replaceable. As in, you are a manager, okay? So you lost track. You lost connection with the software. But what if you get kicked out of that company for any reason, even just uh, oh, sure. you've been made redundant at that point? Might be, I mean, you might find another place and that's going to be okay. Or you might find that it might be more difficult. So if I say uh, Max, for instance, is like if the person is maybe the manager, but he also knows how he learned Blender, I think it's, I would consider more him than a person that doesn't know Blender, but it's, it's a manager. I don't know. It's, it's, I think it's, a, I think it depends because you don't, you can't predict. Too much how the future is gonna um be for the companies so in a way i think i always feel like it's a bit safer to know also the softwares i think but there I, is I a think, yeah. i think there is a jump to management in which you are you become responsible for the project uh, intended as a broader entity yeah. so and if that works yeah it you are going to be a very key element for as long as the people you work with realize that the projects are delivered because of that in fact, it might be more difficult for the people who work with you to understand that a project is delivered because you're around. Then <laughs> I think that yeah. then uh, I don't have a comparison really, but I'm just saying it must be it might be difficult for people around you to know that a project is delivered because you are around, especially if you don't yeah. touch the software and they don't see you acting. And if you're a very if your work is with people, they may not know that. I think it's maybe more if you are a manager, just a manager, I think it's more connected to I mean, you, you kind of have a more of a trust uh, between you and the company rather than, you know, the, the things that we were talking about uh, of moving of people moving around from a company to another. I think if you're a manager, you're probably more linked to the company, in my opinion. Which is which is okay. I think if I were if I were to be just a manager now, I think if, I would be be fine because I'm I've been at Blue Zoo for a while. But I think if I were to leave Blue Zoo and go somewhere else, I think it would be um, more difficult maybe to sell myself as a proper manager because I don't know that company. So it, it would take me a while. It's a mindset learn. again. You would have to in the new company. You would have to learn who the people are, what they are doing, and how are the processes there. So it's just a mindset. I don't think there is any single company in the world that works in an ideal way as in the way things should be. I don't think that's possible. Probably otherwise, not. otherwise movies would be made in one month. Okay. And, and that's not the case. So there is, <laughs> that, that company doesn't exist. So guys, if you're looking for heaven somewhere, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Remember, heaven is, heaven is often promised after you're gone, so <laughs> not while you're around, at least where we come from. But there are different philosophies anyway. By the way, Francesca, in the chat, there was someone you know, Luigi Camucca, who says hello oh. and also <laughs> says that you should never stop studying. And I think from him, I think it's oh, good it, advice to receive. It, yeah, it was, it, he's... It, Hi, Luigi. It's like he's always been learning. It's like he, he was great. It's like he was my he was my mentor. <laughs> and I think he, he's he's older than us all. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. I think he's someone who's older than us all and knows a, a certain I, amount of stuff. I think. I remember him making like um uh, making tools in Mel uh, for something that was not even in Maya, and I remember it because it, it was easier for him. So it was just to making like tools in Mel. <laughs> to, yeah, I remember we we did a project in Nuke. At a certain point, we worked together, and at the time, Max, this is going to make you laugh. You know, Nuke is a comp software, right? Like After Effects, and you're going to render stuff, but if you specify as a destination a folder that does not exist, by default, Nuke couldn't create that folder. It would just throw an error in rendering. And I remember Luigi, Luigi, Luigi saying, it doesn't create a folder. <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> now Nuke added that tick box. They can create a folder when it doesn't exist. We made it, guys. We made it. So <laughs> <laughs> we pushed it. <laughs> That's how they create those long change lists when a new version of the, the software comes out. Yeah. God. And we have, some, we have someone in the chat saying that they agree that Companies, they don't have perfect setup. And Luigi, Luigi Francesca is saying, yes, he's a lot older than us. I think so. <laughs> but for reference, can we say how old we are? Can we ask, uh, is it considered uh, bad education, guys, if we say our age? 
I'm 42. Uh, 42. I'm 35. Keep forgetting it. 35. I am 39. Okay. Nine. Well, I'm I think 39. 39. 39. Yes. Amadeo. <laughs> so young. You're becoming a man. I'm becoming a little man. Nice. Not fully grown up yet, but getting there. Nice there. <laughs> so I think Luigi is a lot older than us, is he not? He could be some 10 years older. I don't want to make we him feel We should old. have invited him for this chat. Then. Maybe we yeah, should yeah, invite him next time. He knows because... how to not not to be mm -hmm. obsolete because he's like uh, he's been dealing with like really various clients, like uh, with really different expectation. He, uh, he dealt with clients as well, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so we're, we're talking about think, somebody yeah. who's older compared to us and they master the technical side and also the client side. No, and Francesca which, is 35, not 45. Right. Francesca is 35, 35, 35. In the chat, they, in the chat they say, Francesca, 45. No, no, 35, 35. She's the youngest. I'm, I'm actually among the, the oldest. No, I mean, yes, now at Blue Zoo, I feel like I'm among the old people uh, because like there are all the um, all the people that were uh, they are in the twenties uh, joining the company, so I am I am fe I'm still feeling like I'm I'm old. I don't know, I, I don't know. We talked about uh, anime and, and we don't we yeah. don't watch the same. It's it's very really weird. <laughs> there, there is a, when you when you move into a company which has hired a lot of juniors, there is you can start to sense the difference. I I sense it now when I teach. Until say five years ago, mm -hmm. me and my students were more or less considering each other the same age. Now I can tell that there is a much greater difference and they, I can tell that they, are, they sense it. And I read uh, uh, an essay from Orwell when he was talking about his time as a student. And he said that kids look up at their, at their teachers and they see them deformed and smelly because they smell in a different way. They have different proportions. So the experience that a, a student has of a teacher when there is a certain gap is in a way... Uh, disturbed by the difference, the physical appearance and the physical, the different physical um, atmosphere that this person creates. It's I'm a very interesting gonna, phenomenon. Yeah. I'm not going to get close to a junior anymore. <laughs> when I, when I, if I need to explain something, always through Zoom. <laughs> always through Zoom. Don't smell me, please. And I, I filter to make you look younger. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. So, yes, at the end of the day, I think... One thing which is interesting about age, especially in the definition for which I was burnt by Max, is that the, the definition of age does not include any quality. It's just the length of time somebody has been around. Experience is what you have been experiencing instead. So we go back again. You, have to, you can grow old, you can be still very experienced or have very little experience, I guess. But I don't know. Do you think five years from now you will be a lot more obsolete, Max? What do you think? Or actually, Max, well, I think you not... have to go. Come again? You are in a rush, Max. Can I ask you a uh, question? No, no, yeah, of course, of course. Well, uh, I would say I, I, will, I will become... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm slowing down obsolescency. I'm trying to <laughs> slow it down as, long as, 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 as much as possible. Not aging, of course, but like just not being good at what I'm doing. That's why I went back to school two years ago. I took a sabbatical. I went to study game design, so new software. Uh, to, I, I basically got myself up to date. And I was also sharing the, the class with people that were 20 years younger than me. So that also helped on the, on the, uh, the, 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 the human side to interface with people that were much younger. And I, I really didn't felt that difference. I don't know if they did. Uh, I don't think they did. Feel, perceive me as as much older than than them, uh, but in general, I, I I think that I'm gonna I'm not gonna be very obsolete in two years or four or five years because that's the approach that I take. I I, I constantly try to put myself out of the comfort zone and, and learn something new, put myself in trouble, get new jobs, and, and yeah. That's the thing. Nice. And on that note, I think it's time for our recommendations, guys. I think it's time to wrap it up. So from I, I can start. From my side, I'm going to suggest a Japanese movie just because, as you know, <laughs> we are into Japan in this period <laughs> of our life. So the movie you are talking about and I'm going to propose tonight is called Seppoku 
or Harakiri, if you find the English version. There are there is a remake, but I, what what I want you to watch is the one from 1962. The director is Masaki Kobayashi. I'm going to post the link in here, in the chat. And as a brief note to the story, we are in a time in Japan in which there aren't many wars anymore. And a lot of samurais have no lord, so they became ronin. And at the time, a samurai couldn't be uh, dishonored in taking regular jobs. They wouldn't even be able to get them because people wouldn't give them the job because they were samurais. So a lot of ronins, in an attempt to make it even, to, get, to earn some money, they decided to go into the castles of lords which were still active and ask to use the, co the courtyard to commit harakiri. Then the lord of the castle, or who for him, told them, don't do it here, you're going, to, you're going to make everything dirty with blood, or we don't want to see that. And they gave them some money, and they sent them away. So this became common practice. At a certain point, however, one of the group of soldiers, and the Lord is not there, uh, greets one such Ronin, and they told him, go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Spoilers that's the, ahead. That's the story. And after this event... A much older Ronin shows up at the same castle and, and wants to tell these young soldiers a story. This old soldier has been in fight. He remembers how he was done. So he starts to tell his story and he's someone with a lot of experience. So I will leave you to that. It's a great story. I would suggest you watch the original just because I haven't seen the remake. It's a great movie. Watch it. So here's my recommendation for the day. Anything else, guys, from you? So I have a video the, game. Uh, so the samurais didn't want to learn Blender, I see. Mm. Yes. No. The, <laughs> the samurai doesn't want to learn Blender. <laughs> <laughs> or is the samurai who doesn't need to learn Blender. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I have a recommendation for a video game. Sorry if I didn't push it on, on our chat. It's called Axiom Verge. Axiom it's, Verge. It's, yeah. Uh, I think you can find it on Steam. You can find it. I'm playing it on my Nintendo Switch right now. So Axiom Verge is a game that looks totally old. It really looks old. It's a, it's a <laughs> game that is basically, we can say it's a clone of the good old Metroid. So it stays, stays in the general, like the Metroidvania games. It's a, it's a, a big uh, uh, a genre that originated in the 1986, I think, when Metroid came out and uh, and Castlevania Symphony of the Night came out. But anyway, so my girlfriend was watching me play this game. I was like, why is this game looking so old? And this is because <laughs> they are mimicking the style of back then. But this game is far from obsolete. In fact, it basically uses um, a lot of meta narrative. And it's interesting because what you're doing in this game is a really new take. And it's a very original take on the traditional uh, uh, genre of game. Because you basically, the weapons that you have, the skills that you have, allow you to glitch the game. So uh, a lot of these games have glitches because they weren't tested properly or because the technology wasn't there. So this game actually, most of the skills that you have simulate that ability to glitch games uh, that some people discovered in, in, the, in, in the past. So I, I find it like very fresh, uh, even if it looks very old. Nice. It reminds me of, of the old platformers I used to yeah. play. Yeah, yeah, the graphics is absolutely. The graphics is old. The game is not obsolete. Nice. Thank you very much, Max. And then, the, Francesca, you have a suggestion as well. Yes. Okay. So today I wasn't sure what to do about the anime because I did. I, I knew some some anime that could have been a good uh, call for for the topic. But I haven't watched it yet, so I couldn't recommend it. So I thought instead of recommending or thinking of some anime that were uh, they're really old, but to me are still they still feel like really good anime uh, despite the, the age. And uh, so I have like three really quick um, recommendations. And I thought about it like these are really obvious for Italians because we we grew up with them, especially if you are my age. Uh, but they're not obvious in around Europe. I think like Europe didn't have necessarily the same coverage of uh, of anime that we got in uh, in Italy. This is like one of my favorites when I was a kid, and is the Secret of Blue Water. I put the um, 
the uh, um, you can you can keep the, the trailer. I think yeah, this I, is like I, the, I remember it the name yes, of it. Uh, um, it was really, <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is this is an old story, but it was a really good story because it's uh, it's set in the 20th century uh, during the Industrial Revolution, and uh, and it has so this really nice uh, steampunk feeling. But also it's based on um, on on uh, Jules Verne's stories, so it has a lot of uh, of insight. Like uh, it has the Nautilus, the uh, submarine uh, with um, Captain Nemo. So it's it's actually it's actually really interesting because he put together some uh, really cool books from from that period uh, and uh, and and really nice and really generally really nice uh, setup and really nice environments. Um, and uh, and and this is I don't I don't think it's like it's so well known in Europe, but it was definitely really well known in uh, in, in Italy. Yeah, in Italy. It was... Well, it should because uh, uh, Disney basically ripped it off to make Atlantis. Yes. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you watched Atlantis from Disney and you thought that's something was off, off <laughs> go watch The Secret of Blue Water because that's where it comes from. <laughs> Thank you very much, Max, for the for pointing that out. Anything and then, else, Francesca? Yeah, then the other ones is like the uh, this is like super famous in Italy, and it was my it's basically like uh, one of the uh, probably strongest uh, female characters ever. This is like uh, the Rose of Versailles, <laughs> and uh, and I think it's yeah again although it's super famous in uh, in Italy, I found some people didn't know it here, for instance, um, and that really surprised me. So I thought like well let's let's just share it. Uh, and um, yeah, it's about. I mean, like, I don't know if I no, I don't have the time probably to get into it. Just watch it. It's uh, it's set into the uh, French Revolution, and uh, and it's basically the story of a uh, um, uh, royal guards. That's actually that's that, that's a woman, but she's been gr grew up as a as a man, and she does this job really well. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a woman <laughs> whose whose father wanted to have a, a boy as a as a son, and yes. so she had to live up to the expectations in a military environment. I don't remember. Does she pretend to be a man? She she uh, does yeah, she does. Yeah. I think no yeah, no. Yeah. I, yeah, some people knew I, that she was a woman, but the majority didn't know. I it. think for the most part, she she acts as a man, and she's considered a man. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Although you wouldn't say so necessarily from the pictures. <laughs> yeah, I think this is like, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to recommend this because like it's, it belongs to the period where you are a girl and you, and you watch sojo manga, which are uh, basically just for girls. Uh, but actually, th this is a good story. So it doesn't really matter. It, it's like, I mean, yeah, the, the, the audience should, is mostly female, but it doesn't really matter. It was like a, yeah. it's definitely a good and story. I will wrap up, Francesca. So mm -hmm. maybe for the next time some some other recommendation yeah. and i will wrap up with a bit of a of a hint uh on sunday this week at 1 p.m british standard time we're going to have a call with a an animator a game animator who has moved to japan to work on games the animator has worked on uh, total war warhammer and they have worked um G gabriel has worked also on death stranding so we are really curious. He moved to Tokyo, and I believe he moved to Tokyo to work on Death Stranding. So I'm really curious to know from here how this worked for him. I think his material is excellent. I don't know if you agree, but... Oh, fuck. I've seen his animation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's great stuff, and I'm really, really looking forward to it. So I'm going to paste the link to... I'm going to paste the link in the chat. So... Have a look at it, guys. Set a reminder if you're interested. And apart from that, if you liked tonight's, tonight's stream, please remember to like, subscribe, leave a comment below. If you, and also, if you have questions for Gabriele for next time, come along with the questions. Remember, the chat is always open. And share the video with your friends so that we can keep doing more of this. So I guess this will be all for us. Thank you very much again, and I will see you the next time. Probably Bye, on a Sunday. Ciao. Bye-bye. Right. Ciao.